Hey, Tolerators. It's me, Natalie, with your before show updates on all things Team Tolerator. So we are sitting on the January, February, March side of life. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like the misogyny meltdown over on Patreon is well underway. That is a new series and show that I am producing for Patreon members only because there is a lot of scripting and a lot of vulnerability going on. I've already sang a song. I've already produced a skit. I'm already writing comedy. So, so go take a chance on the misogyny meltdown and the way that to all the men I've tolerated before is expanding and evolving with the link in the show notes. For January, we celebrated the Misogynist of the Year award ceremony. For February, we are focusing on the concept of love and self-love being part of the resistance. And in March, why, yes, we're still going to do seasonal things with celebrating International Women's Month. And all of that will be wrapped up into our new variety show, Misogyny Meltdown. I cannot wait for you to check it out. Tolerators, this is to all the men I've tolerated before with Natalie Katona, your weekly look at everyday misogyny. Today we have back with us Julia Washington and our friend Katie. Is it Rosen or Rosin? I meant to ask that. Fuck. <laughs> it's Rosen. <laughs> I'm leaving that. Today we have a very important topic. Uh, we, the three of us will be discussing the war being raged against women and by the war being raged against women i mean netflix it's audacity and love is blind season six welcome katie (laughs) thank you i'm so happy to be here it's gonna be a wild ride katie because when natalie and i are together (laughs) empires crumble (laughs) you know i've heard and now i get to be part of it and what a joy (laughs) we're so excited i'm excited katie Give the listeners some background in your relationship with reality TV. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, it's a, well, I guess we're going all the way back to like whatever, what, 2000 when Survivor started. Um, I wasn't, I never got in on the like MTV reality shows because uh, I'm Canadian (laughs) and I was, so we had much music. It was a little different. I mean, we did have MTV, but. We also did it, you know? So, I mean, I did it. So, I, yeah, so I watched Survivor. I watched American Idol. I basically started with competition reality shows. I did not watch any dating. I I mean, I guess I also watched America's Next Next Top Model and Project Runway when I had those available to me. But dating shows were, like, not it for me until... Um, I graduated from university. I was at my like first office job. My friend was like, okay, you have to watch The Bachelor. And I was like, I don't think I do, actually. (laughs) But she uh, was right. And I did have to watch it. And so I started with Ali Fedotowski season. And I was like, oh, well, this is my personality now. So basically, since then, I have watched every dating show that has become available to me. I did watch the reboot of Joe Millionaire, which yes. honestly was so good and more people should have watched it and I'm kind of devastated that it will never, like, it's not, although the one of the guys from it is like now has his own spinoff, so like at least there's that. It was great. So now reality TV is like basically most of my life. I watch competition shows, Big Brother, Big Brother Canada, Survivor. I watch um so much bravo i watch all the dating shows netflix cable whatever is available my brain is rotten and it is both broken and put back together because of reality tv i guess is like the very long-winded way of explaining the relationship with reality you are reality tv i like at least 65 percent oh i love that 
I'm 65%. Like, I'm 65% Taylor Swift lyrics. Katie is 65% reality. Reality. reality Yeah, absolutely. That's why you're very important that you're here. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Because you'll remember things from the season. Yeah. (laughs) You're also the reason why I dove head first back into southern Char- southern charm and then yeah. high proxy summer house yeah. <laughs> oh yeah oh <Hell> yeah <laughs> okay i was gonna save th- this is last on my outline but katie and i were talking earlier and i think it actually needs to be first <laughs> i think what love is blind season six made me realize and the bachelor had kind of made me realize post shelter in place post covid being dramatic all of it is i'm so upset with reality tv currently except for bravo i'm never upset with bravo because they understand this cardinal rule women built all of these franchises we are the audience we are what keeps it going we are what makes it thrive we are the butts of jokes in every instance when it comes to reality tv and yet Netflix has decided that women are their like playground and victims when it comes to Love is Blind. And honestly, they just like trickle us down to Chelsea's cleany, Jess is hot, AD has a body, yada yada. And, <laughs> and which is a problem, by the way. Which is a problem, by the way. Because the hypersexualization of black women is not is a thing. It is yes. a thing. And it like was so glaring in this season that I was just like, okay. I just saw one of my notes and I realized I have to take back what I said about Bravo. Um Bravo <laughs> is in fact upsetting me. And it's because Vanderpump rules while so while this season of Love is Blind is going on, I'm also preparing for our future Scandaval retake episode with Annie because the Underpump Rules is giving me a redemption arc for Tom Sandoval. Oh. And it's like, no, what what year is this? <laughs> so maybe Netflix and maybe they're the problem. Because I watched these interviews with the cast and I was like, did everyone get a bad edit? Because people be confused. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But also, okay, I'm going to be that bitch. Netflix Love is Blind is very clear to not call themselves a dating show. It's an experiment. It's an experiment. So there's a, I feel like there's a lot more they can do in terms of whatever story they want to tell us because, yes, the goal is to get married, but also, is it really? And you know what has a history of not treating women well? Science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boom. Science. I'm going to counterpoint your counterpoint with Nick and Vanessa's literal lecturing us about the sanctimony of love is blind being about marriage and no, love I hated falling that. in love blind it's worse. I, I literally hated that because one no you don't get to do that nick and vanessa lachey we remember what you did <laughs> <laughs> justice for jessica i don't know is that a thing but like no you don't get to do that and and sure like the end goal is to get married okay but also they have so many issues within the franchise within for sure, seasons five and six. I can't remember if there was anything with season four. I know you kept saying save the ballerina because that man is yeah. dangerous. <laughs> that man is dangerous. But like with season five when they're like, oh, there were couples we couldn't even show because the men weren't vetted well. And you're just like, huh? What? That was just so wild. Terrifying. And then this season with, you know speaking of redemption arcs i don't know if you guys are paying attention to clay's press tour and that's essentially what he's doing and it's driving me mm-hmm. i'm just like you don't get no we can't do this one I'm so thing bad. I think, yeah one thing i think is interesting about love is blind is it really seems like most of the women apply because they both want to get married and you know want to have a bigger following like the the, the dual reasons anyone goes on a dating show but, like, the men, I think, mostly get recruited. These are not men who applied to the show. These are men who were just out there living their lives. Someone reached out and was like, well, do you want to do this show? And they're like, okay. Yeah, like, I follow this hot guy on IG. Let's send him a DM. And I'm, you know, a cast, a cast, a uh, casting person. So it's yeah. like the women are, like, into it. They want to be here. They want to get everything they can out of the experiment. And the men are like, whatever, I got asked to do this. Yeah. 
And in in Jeremy, in Jeremy's case, I think he just needed a place to stay for a week <laughs> during his breakup. Oh my uh, gosh. But AD was recruited. I found that out today. AD has tried oh. to be, yes, she was recruited for Love is Blind and took the spot on Love is Blind, but she has since disclosed that Married at First Sight has tried to recruit her. The Bachelor has tried to recruit her. Really? I mean... Everyone has taste, I guess. Everyone. <laughs> All right. I would like to I wonder off. why she... Sorry. I, I wonder why she chose Love is Blind over the others. Love is Blind is hotter right now, I bet. And do you think maybe because of the, like, location, like, you go away for a little bit, but then you get to come back and film where you already live? I guess I don't really know that much about Married at First Sight. That has not entered into my... It is in the city that you're living in. Yeah, well... But do you get a fabulous trip to some all-inclusive, you, you do. know, tropical? Okay. Well, there goes both of our you, ideas. What you don't get is as big of a following. Okay, yeah, fair. Because I Married at First Sight is on Lifetime. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, Cameron and, and Lauren have really done very, very well for themselves in turning, you know, their LIB appearances into sustainable business models. Yeah. Yeah, and Deep D and Natalie. Oh, yeah, them too. People love that podcast. Yeah. I think it makes the most sense to go couple by couple, person by person, and then dissect why, what part of our society and misogyny do they represent for me, for you, for everybody. (laughs) Love it. I'm ready. Who are we talking about first? We're dissecting the war against women. So we're going to talk about our fallen or maybe are undesirables <laughs> depending on who oh. they are oh sasquatch is that who you're talking about first oh. the one you refer to as sasquatch no i'm not talking about sasquatch first i'm talking about the ai robot that was matthew oh <laughs> uh, okay i matthew's on the spectrum but continue i think he can be neurodivergent and also a dick that's called feminism that is equality <laughs> People are allowed to be complicated. Yes. It's nuanced. Yes. It's layered. <laughs> Trishel can be really good at traitors and a racist, I promise. <laughs> yes. But back to Matthew, the AI robot. To circle back. So back to Ma- so Matthew, our little AI robot. Um, first off, he supposedly got a bad edit. And Sarah Ann did confirm that he did not walk out on her, which is fine. Do we trust Sarah Ann? No, never. She's a patriot. (laughs) I trust that one detail because it was so funny. It had to be fake. He's not that funny. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think everything else I feel like is he is just him. Right. And I feel like part of the reason why I'm frustrated with these new seasons of Love is Blind is because they are playing an editing game with me and they're not smart enough to pull it off to where I'm like, I know your tricks. Interesting. There's a real genuineness to Married at First Sight to the point where this last season was really boring and I hated it and I give a whole weekend to it. There's a genuineness to Married at First Sight on Lifetime that Love is Blind has never completed because Love is Blind is crafting a story and Married at First Sight is letting that story happen. And if mess happens, that's even better. Well, in the formula of Love is Blind too, right? They never cap more than five couples. Like, do we ever know if there's more than five? We don't, we never know. It's always max five couples. So 10 people that we follow. And again, it is an experiment. So like, whatever the results are, they're telling us and it's not peer reviewed. I don't know. Is that science language? Yeah, (laughs) it's not. It doesn't follow the scientific rigor that you would hope for from an actual experiment. Correct. Because they're leaning into the whole I we're an experiment. Whatever happens, happens. But here are these NDAs and here are these contracts and here are these rules you have to follow. But then also they don't honor that either you know what i mean like they like set up the rules but then they also change the rules it feels like it feels like maybe they mean experiment in the type of like experimental art like like we're just trying stuff who knows what'll work yeah throw spaghetti at the wall and see what yeah. sticks. but i think because they can't 
decide if they're an experiment or a dating show. They're like somewhere in between. There's this confusion for all of us because then you're just like, wait, but if the goal is to get married, Nick and Vanessa, then why are all of these other things chaotic? Like it really felt like season six was so messy. And I don't personally care for all of the super duper mess of reality TV. Like I know from being friends with Natalie and now Katie, that there is some depth there. I just have a hard time wading through it because I live in a, in a purple county where everyone has barely graduated high school and no critical thinking skills. So it's hard. It's hard to sit through sometimes because I'm like, oh, it's Friday night at a bar. I can't do it. The thing about Matthew and his audacity is first he tried to be like, well, I'm different than everyone. And I'm like, how so, my dude? And he's like, well, I'm sober. And I was like, mm, it should have made you smarter. <laughs> okay, I actually feel like maybe Matthew was conducting his own experiment within the experiment. And this is my theory on Matthew from the very beginning is that, every, and this is the reason why he spoke in the pause and not to any of the men in the living quarters, is because everything that he said was written by ChatGPT. I wanted, to, I think he wanted to see if it could be done. He got them to write, he got ChatGPT or whatever chatbot he likes to create those 15 questions and then to create scripts that he could use in certain situations that he either memorized using his robot brain or, you know, or he had them written down somewhere. I just feel it, or like he just, you know, like those were his ideas that he had. He like read some things on the internet and was like, these are things that you can say. And that's why we had the duplication. <laughs> yeah, but also, like, without having... Does he not have friends? No. Because, like, you need... Like, for someone to to do that, then also have the audacity to not consider the answers for themselves? Like, sir, have you never dated? No. You're 37 years old. Do you not know how dating works? And maybe that's true. <laughs> like, Natalie keeps saying he doesn't know how... But it's, like, for me, it was one of those things where I'm just, like, I... I for... When it comes to dating, like, I'm looking for that intimate connection. And if I ask you a question and it, your answer is monosyllabic or you don't have one, we have a problem. So Matthew triggered me because dating app dates trigger me. And this is why. Matthew, to me, represented on a very large, very robotic, very awkward, and I've got your number way, the way that dating apps have made men believe that dating is either an experiment where you experiment until you get like the result of the data points that you wanted to get like the list which dating should be an experiment but the way that men manipulate dating now to where it's like I have my five things and you must meet my five things and if you do not meet my five things I don't invest back into you as a person so I think that that's why we keep getting these scenarios like with Matthew, where he was like, why would I answer this question? I'm interviewing you as the role of a girl I want to date. Yeah, I think that Matthew does have friends, but I think his friends are exclusively on the Internet. And I also feel like Matthew has thought of him. And like, look, I love Internet friends. We're Internet friends. It can be great. But I think there's the only, those are the only ones he has. And I also think that he has if not said out loud thought internally to himself that he is a high value man you know you know that like i think that's how he can think of it he's like okay i have a good job i have like an apartment i guess i have whatever the things are that he decides make him a high value man and he therefore he that's it that's all he needs to do but men do think that, though. Like, how many times have we listened to our married friends whose husbands are like, well, I have a job and I pay for this house. What more do you want from me? A lot more than that, sir, because I could do that for my sale. So I have a Matthew in my life. And by God, I hope he stopped listening to this by now because we haven't talked in a while. But sometimes he pops up. <laughs> and the whole thing about it is it's the, well, I deserve the most because I am the most. But then there's this, like, complex system where... You think that you're living up to it, and then all of a sudden they drop a bombshell on you where it's like, this made me A, B, and C kind of upset. And you're like, at what point were you going to stop my behavior and have a discussion with me before blowing up? And it it's always this, 
because they're doing like the the science work behind the scenes and they're doing like robot math they're it takes a lot of the emotional investment and the emotional labor off of them because they're like i mean i and then it's like okay well like that's how friendships and relationships work we have continuous conversations we don't just wait for three years to be upset at me about something i've done since day one all right well now i'm ready for sasquatch (laughs) i'm ready for trevor (laughs) by the way my notes for today are literally just a a list of their real names because i had to google them i was like what if i don't actually know everyone's real name (laughs) because i've been because i have fun nicknames so sasquatch who i was rooting for i was rooting for trevor i love a lumberjack with a heart of gold and like all tyra banks cute tyra (laughs) she should have been at the reunion (laughs) to find out after i almost cried because he told chelsea that she was wearing that stupid tapping bracelet i'm thinking about you bracelet and he was tapping it all day long that it probably annoyed her because it kept vibrating on her wrist and she wasn't even fucking wearing it. I was like, I'm devastated. Love is, in fact, not real. <laughs> and I'm done. To find out that this man had some backup plan girl. And, like, truly you can't call it anything but a backup plan girl. Where this woman, I believe, consensually agreed for him to be on the show and for him to be like, don't worry, baby, it's all going to work out. I'm either going to fall in love with someone else or I'm coming right back to you. Ugh, no, I don't like it. I don't like it. And it screams privilege, like I'm still going to get mine. And then to sit, then to sit in front of Nick and Vanessa as they're lecturing to me, the sanctity of love is blind and love. <laughs> and to take the like stance of a toddler (laughs) to be like i don't think anyone's ever told me my behavior is bad nick i'd like to go i'm like and the fact that nick said you can go now i'm like no make him talk more like he he needs to explain this (laughs) but he couldn't he didn't know how and that was the part that for me was infuriating because it's like you clearly thought that someone was gonna hand you something to say bullet points a script note cards or something like zero preparation for a reunion whatsoever and then you melted down and asked to be excused like i feel like he must have had a response prepared for a situation that didn't involve nick and vanessa posting his texts on a screen (laughs) duty readers theater for (laughs) for 15 minutes I mean, this was one of the best reunions they've ever done. Like always, always bring the receipts, please. <laughs> they knew they knew they needed to get us on their side, and they tried their hardest. They sure did. Yeah. Well, he should have hired a publicist. And then what bothered me about the reunion is they allowed like Trevor Sasquatch to melt down or whatever. But like Chelsea got to address him, but not in any way that was meaningful to me. Because Nick was posing the questions for Chelsea. He was like, how's Chelsea supposed to feel about this? And I'm like, well, maybe Chelsea should speak. Is it possible that Chelsea just doesn't care? And she, so she wouldn't have had anything to say because she's like, I don't care about this. And they're like, okay, well, we want to talk about it. So we're going to ask questions. Chelsea, phone in. <laughs> Chelsea, phone in. So yeah, the whole, and again, it's a lack of like emotional intelligence and emotional investment in this, in on his part and i worry about this backup plan girl nicholas shea like read your text messages out loud and now the whole world knows that you're the backup plan yeah which is like my biggest fear is somebody like foia or pra my cell phone and they go through it i mean i feel like they must have those texts because she sent them she sent them <laughs> she is fine with it annie and i our other reality tv correspondent annie and i have said that we would love nothing more than for one of our idiot exes to go on to Love is Blind or The Bachelor or anything and for us to make our money off of Facebook messages, emails, text messages, whatever TMZ wants, TMZ's getting for me. And we are doing it as a petty revenge plot and we're bragging about it. And that's feminism. <laughs> I think that's true. That's what it is. It's just when women get theirs, 
feminism. I don't I don't make the rules. <laughs> no, we we're, we're just here to live by them. I'm just every woman, it's all in me if you watch the misogyny meltdown for March. <laughs> like Yeah. <laughs> Trevor, it was gross. It was icky. He's just like Well, and the thing that I think was really upsetting for me was just I was so upset that Chelsea didn't pick him. Like I really felt like they were a couple I could like root for. Yeah. And I was like, it's like, oh, they feel like they could fit together so nicely and give us that HEA we want from Love is Blind. And then it wasn't. And then, I mean, is now the time that we move on to talk about why? <laughs> Before we talk about why. <laughs> I didn't know that Jessica was the first single mom on Love is Blind. Like, they said it pretty early, but it had never hit me that they had never had a single mom on Love is Blind. And it's because single parents are very prevalent in not married at first sight because that would be a fucking shit show. But like <laughs> <laughs> Bachelor Nation, I'm sure other I'm sure like, I don't know, do any of the sexy shows have single parents like the Temptation Islands, the Fuck Boys, the Temptation no, FY... Island usually no, I think. And FY Island no. Oh, okay, so maybe it's just no. the Bachelor that gives single parents a chance. Yeah, there really isn't a whole lot for people who maybe are divorced or single to yeah, who have it's children. Just the bachelor. Yeah. Oh, devastating. ABC. But also, I feel like ABC understands that they can like like a single dad pot, or yeah. like a single mom creates a narrative for the bachelor. Yes. That. Yeah, it's like either hot or tragic, and they like both of those things. Do we believe that Jessica being a single mom was handled correctly by Netflix, by herself, by the men? I will say the only one who was noble about it is Boring Johnny, is Boring Jay. He was the one who immediately said, hey, that was great to know. I'm glad that I know it, and I need you to know that I'm out. <laughs> he was Mark Cuban. <laughs> As a... As a person who's been a single mom dating for going on 20 years, it happens a lot. Like, I didn't even put in my dating profile that I had kids until, like, he was out of the house. Because it is, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with men, but a single woman with a kid, it triggers something in their brain. I don't know. Is it, I can't dominate. I can't be number one. I don't know what it is. But it is definitely a deterrent for Mm -hmm. and then i and then your friends are like well if he can't you know with you and your kids then he's not worth it it's like that's literally every man on the planet so let's start raising better men so true right because julia and i did have a disagreement in the dms about this because i thought right because i thought that because because i was thinking of the game and i was thinking about like okay it's love is blind because I've played fake Love is Blind. I go, okay, it's Love is Blind. You have X amount of days, X amount of time, X amount of men. And I'm trying to get to the Dominican Republic because I deserve a vacation. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 So in my head, I'm playing a game. And I was like, Jessica has to weed off the men who don't like other people's kids immediately. She cannot mm-hmm. be wasting her time with Jimmy, who's going to pretend to want to raise her kid because now he's quote unquote invested like she has to russian roulette through that and be like yeah so i'm the first mom and julie was like no she can't do that because that's do that. horrible on hinge and tinder yeah and in the and then you're in a controlled environment in this situation so then you're immediately so then now you can't escape it so at least with like online dating you can like turn off your phone and call your girlfriend and be like come over with ice cream and wine you can't do that in love is blind you're contained these women that are in the pods with you, you don't have the same relationship with them. They don't understand the nuance of your single motherhood. You know, they can try, but like, I've had a lot of new friends where I'm like, mm, you're not it because you make my single motherhood this weird thing and I don't like it. So it, it becomes part of your fabric when you're dating to not mention that you have children. So then to go on a dating show, it's just natural, right? Like now it's what you do. So then to bring it up later in the game is part of we said game but it's part of the process when you've been sort of like not concealing it but not leading with oh i pushed something out of my badge 10 years ago i think it's like i mean i think it felt like the way she you know went about the experiment and then the way she then brought it up to you know like jimmy like once she got to that point with him was very much like 
I want you to get to know who I am as a person. You're going to fall in love with me, Jessica. And then I will introduce you to other aspects of my life that might affect logistics, but aren't about who I am as a person. Because it immediately becomes about, oh, well, you have a kid and that's your personality. Regardless, like no one sees you beyond that at all. I can't wait for Nick Lachey and Vanessa to call me personally because I keep calling their stupid show a game <laughs> and that there's strategy <laughs> involved. Hear me like, yeah, this is about love. This is about marriage. This is about <laughs> Vanessa and I proving that we have brain cells. And I'm going to be like, okay, Nick. <laughs> like, Yeah, it's not perfect match. You're not trying to stay. You'll be like, yes, you're trying to stay to the end, but also hopefully be married like Cameron and Lauren or the Bennetts. Yes. Or the Browns, I mean. Do we believe? So I have seen two stories come on the TikToks and the interwebs about Jessica. And at first, during that reunion, I was like, who knew? That after all of it, Jessica, and it, I knew that AD was going to be the biggest girl's girl, but who knew that Jessica would also be leading that charge of being the girl's girl, of having Chelsea be her kids, her, her kid who's almost a teenager. And I was like, why did I think that kid was three? <laughs> like, I heard her entire life story. <laughs> she looks young. Well, she, and she was a teen mom, right? So isn't she like also like 27, 28? Yeah, yeah she is young. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so she still is yeah. young. But I think for me, like, okay, first of all, I have very strong opinions about putting your children on the internet, period, the end. I'm not a fan. I worked in public safety. I've seen how human trafficking works through social media. I have seen how people who are predators, like, find your kid. Like, I've seen the dark side. I am not pro, like, mommy blogging. I am I mean, talk about being a mom, but don't put your kids in it. Call them something else. Don't show their faces. Don't make your kids' names a hashtags. I think I've had this rant on your show before. So then now you have this huge platform that Love is Blind gives you. And all of her TikToks that come across my feed are with her child, who is a beautiful little girl. So then, of course, I immediately go to doom and gloom of like, I really hope that you're doing everything you can to protect that child, which she probably is. And I'm not judging her for doing it. It is her decision. I just really, really, really struggle because after three human trafficking stings all through uh, social media, you get jaded about putting your kids online. (laughs) Fair. Because, like, there was, number one, like, Jessica's too hot for Jimmy. The wonder thumb. And then when (laughs) she's like, you know, I might still be attracted to you. It's like, ma'am, you've now seen him. You can get someone hot. And truly, I hope that she was playing the game in her head. And she's like, I'm coming to the barbecue. I'm coming to the reunion. (laughs) Like, they will will cast me on perfect match. I will be like, oh, I'm so hot. I'm so, like, heartbroken and sad about the wonder thumb. (laughs) I'm so sad. I just, I just feel like... Jessica is representation of people who think a lot of people are hot. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Because Katie, Katie has DM'd me. Katie. And she's like, that man is hot. And I was like, I think you're wrong. <laughs> and she's like, that's fine. And then I go, what about his personality? And she's like, mm, still doing it for me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. To partially support Katie in this, I do think when he smiles, there is like a cuteness to him. Yeah, like a puppy. But when he when he sits there with his mouth agape, I'm just like, Sir. like a, look, I'm not saying he has a face for catalogs. I'm just <laughs> saying that I get it. <laughs> but good on Jessica for like rising above and like making friends and being a girl's girl, and maybe she's healed micah and micah's bullshit because now they're I, friends honestly i am excited for the season of perfect match now so they accomplished that thing all right well now we can go couple by couple and i will be going couple and couple by boring to we gotta talk about it Ooh. <laughs> yes okay so johnny and amy are the most boring so they get to go first i have zero comments on them they're cute great Good for they, them. They got me. Glad someone explained biology to him and how they can avoid pregnancy after Love is Blind aired. So that is why he does. That is why they do get a section. Because it's not Johnny's fault. I'm done yelling at Johnny about it. I'm done feeling like he was trying to control her body because it was coming off very late. My dude, why are you trying to tell her what to do? Johnny was so invested 
in her being on birth control because quote unquote i've just assumed all my girlfriends are on birth control because they keep letting me have sex with them and i'm like "Mm." (laughs) all right my dude (laughs) i mean this is a man who did not know that a vasectomy was a major surgery exactly you know he had some barriers to hurdle well okay so south carolina we could we should confirm with elrenthia but probably an abstinence only program probably but and that's why i allowed myself to let go of the anger because he was team mr that's fine i'll go to the septomy i'll do it and then i was like okay then do it but dare you stop trying to get her to put chemicals in her body that she has researched and said no thank you to and then that idiot said i didn't realize that oh like a vasectomy is a whole procedure like there's like there's like tools and like anesthesia and like pain meds involved and i'm like oh he truly did not know yeah still still less invasive than a tubal ligation um but did you see how hillary duff's uh husband like told him about yes (laughs) what i mean what a way to learn something i know i love it Hillary Duff's husband is an ally. <laughs> he's a fucking gem. A treat. You know? A treat. I just love it. And an ally. And he's allowed to call in whatever he wants. Um, <laughs> the number is so, one. <laughs> so they get like a little segment on the show because part of everyday misogyny is how underprepared we prepare grown people. Or just people. Pre- yeah, or just people in to general control. when it comes to self, sex, health, and education. Yeah, because like Amy knew her shit, but she probably had to do, do a bunch of Google searches. Yeah, right. Johnny's yeah. out here just like free balling, just being like everyone's on a pill, <laughs> pulling out works, condoms who, <laughs> calendar what, and I'll just give a sec to me if it's that big of a deal. And I do like that Amy was like, because of this specific health condition I have, my doctor wants me to be on birth control. And there are still reasons that I, it's like not for me. Like she has thought about it. She was more patient than I would be. And I think that's why I got so irritated because I was like, why does he still push the fuck back if she has all of these receipts? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I think anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I think anxiety is the reason. <laughs> And I, of course, I was triggered. I, like, I have had one man in my life be so concerned about the pregnancy thing where it's, like, a huge turnoff. It's like, bro, like, I don't actually need you to be involved in my birth control because I've got it. I'm a grown woman, and I'm asking you to do things to help me prevent this. But, like, the fact that you're very micromanagey obsessive about it is coming off weird i mean but now that we know that he does like you said but now that we find out that he really didn't know and understand and he's representative of probably 90 percent of the population (laughs) because remember when friend in friends when rachel got pregnant and ross is like but we used a condom and she's like it's on the box it's not 100 percent effective and he's livid like calling the company to complain and you're just like guys dumb men everywhere can now take to congress to be like what do you mean <laughs> all women are on the pill and condoms aren't 100 percent effective <laughs> we need sex ed in schools now that it has affected one white man on television maybe we will get sex ed no, in schools. it wasn't it wasn't the right white man oh well we need Sorry, it to Johnny. be and it wasn't the right tv bit. show correct <laughs> I do have Brittany and Kenneth on here, or as I refer to them, Jesus's favorite mixed couple. They are slightly, <laughs> they are slightly more interesting than Johnny and Amy for two reasons. One, that Brittany was trying so hard to be anti-racist that I, know, I, was I like, identify as a white woman. <laughs> she whipped right back around, and she represents nervous white women everywhere. <laughs> And then I don't like all of the backlash that Kenneth is getting about his sexuality. Yeah. Wait, there's backlash? I missed it. Well, there was like a cousin who alleged and then people got really intense about it. Oh. I think I really am over people like outing people when they're not ready and or making assumptions based on whatever. Like, just stop it. Yeah. Yeah, because I think before the cousin alleged, 
people were already saying it because they're ignorant. They were like, why didn't you want to fuck Britney? Like, I would have at least gotten so far to fuck her. Like, ugh. But it's, it's also like everyone thinking that Alan and Barbie was queer coded when Alan was, I mean, sure, if you want to nice. take it that way, but Alan's just a nice guy who doesn't harm women. So if that means that nice men who don't harm women and aren't like pushy and awful are queer coded, we have a bigger problem. We have a big problem. Mm-hmm. I I also like when so a friend of mine listened to a podcast I did not ask her which one I forgot but she was saying that someone else maybe AD was being interviewed and said that they had had that fight off screen do you have if you guys heard this I have heard this yeah this theory as well that like they broke up the night before mm-hmm. and then Netflix called him back and was like dude on we camera. need to film it yeah which yeah. is why she was Brittany was still so emotional, and Kenneth had, like, already gone. He'd been through it. He was already, he had had that conversation. Texting on his phone. Bro, come get me. Netflix says I'm free. <laughs> yeah. But I did, I was really rooting for them because, hello, I am the product of a black man and a white woman. I'm always here for the team mix when it doesn't make me uncomfortable. So I guess in some respects, I am like a white lady in that respect. She did say some things where I was just like, oh, she's not prepared to raise black children. Like, these babies better come out looking more like her than him because they're going to have a problem otherwise. And I think AD, having that conversation with him in the Dominican Republic is so important because so many well-meaning people want to believe that love will conquer all and it doesn't matter and we will get through it. But what I run into as a person of color of black descent who is black who identifies as black is that one little hurdle sends everyone packing for the hills they're like well that's too hard you're like that's not even the hardest thing and you're already you're already dipping like this is why they're canceling dei okay can i say something a little bit mean always (laughs) i mean we're here if it's too mean i'll put it in the secrets (laughs) okay i just all i wanted to say was just a little joke of like when Kenneth got home and got back on his device and realized that he needed to focus on the education of the children at his charter school and he could not add Brittany to the people whose education yeah. he needed to be in control of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's also real, right? But I have, as a as a white woman who used to be a nervous white woman, I have encountered white women who are raising children of color. Uh-huh. And I have watched those women raise them as white white children. children. While yeah. also spouting things like it's MLK Day, so that's important. Right. Trump isn't our president. And then thinking that like the bumper sticker slogans are doing it. Yeah. But they're actively avoiding school districts where their kids would encounter other black children, or yeah. they're actively avoiding the places where people of color congregate and all of it. And I'm like, mm, not taking not- them to the right hair salons or, you know, things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's bad. And it's, I feel like, because now that I'm 40 and I have all of these years behind me, I feel like it's worse now. Like, my with my generation, the other mixed kids, because we actually had quite a few, Our all of our white parents were, like, not that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they understood that they had children that weren't going to look like them and prepared them for it. I don't know what the fuck this breed is doing now. Because I'm just like, I, I think it's very much the... I don't see color. It's like, well, you have to. Yeah, it's the white knuckling of if we pretend that everyone's the same, everyone's the same. Even and even with black parents who who are like, I see my children as black, and I'm like, you do, but also you're going to your children are gonna run into people who are gonna see them however the fuck they're gonna see them. That's that's the end of the story. Like I got mis I got this hasn't happened in a while. But I got misidentified as a Latina who speaks Spanish the other day. And that used to happen a lot in my younger years. But it, 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 so so it's, I mean, look at me. People can make whatever decision they want about me. And and that's the thing. It's like my brother, people think my brother's Indian all the time. <laughs> and they're just like, eh. so, so So there's these moments where you're just like, this is why classifications of race are so fucking stupid because you're i can walk into a room and someone's gonna be like that woman's mexican i hate her and i'm not sorry that's another tangent i have but to wrap up my point about it though is that i felt like the demise of their relationship was actually good 
because they need to do a lot. Of, they needed to do. Brittany needs to do a lot of like you know the oh you're comfortable dating with black men. So then it becomes like a wait is this a fetish or do you like what's happening? <laughs> like there's so many questions that I have. And they were so comfortable with each other at the reunion that I hope they do have, like, a true friendship. It seems like they are good friends. I mean, the way they said, we've already had the discussion about how we're going to explain our friendship to the next people we date. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're they're friends. They're friends to an alarming degree. Yeah. Yeah, like, she kept touching his knee, and I was like, that move is reserved for people I'm sleeping with, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So they did kill my joke because the entire time she was talking about how comfortable she was with him and the way that he identified racially, I was like, well, yeah, wait until your racist dad meets him. And I was waiting for the racist dad and I never got to meet the racist dad. And now we'll never know if I was right, but we know I was right. (laughs) But we know. But we know. All right. Here comes the big hitters. I'm ready. I'm ready. Who are we hitting first? The Wonder Thumb and Megan Fox. <laughs> oh. Jimmy and Chelsea. Jimmy and Chelsea. Because at this point, they're mid. Like, they they were hot and heavy in the pods like a mess. But by now, they're the least of my problems. <laughs> oh. I mean, Chelsea has now had to deal with the reality that Travis Kelsey did an impression of her, which means <laughs> that potentially Taylor Swift has joked about her at some point. And like that's a lot for her. That's a lot for anyone to go through. We oh, I went and saw Love Lies Bleeding. And there is a part, there is a character in Love Lies Bleeding where this woman is very, very attached to the idea that her and Kristen Stewart character should be dating and or are dating like one of those (laughs) and to get out of hanging out with this girl or to get out of this girl asking her to continue to hang out Kristen Stewart hands her cash and goes just you know take yourself out to dinner on me or like out for a drink or something and I looked at my friend Sam and I go that would devastate me (laughs) if you would rather give me the money (laughs) to just go get that drink instead of having the drink and i feel like if i had to wake up every day going taylor swift and her dumb boyfriend who can't spell squirrel (laughs) made well we don't know that he still can't spell it (laughs) right and also squirrel is hard we can only assume (laughs) the daggers in in natalie's eyes (laughs) taylor swift and her dumb boyfriend who had to look up the words to friends in low places before he drunkenly yelled it to a crowd, are making fun of me, <laughs> a woman with a job, <laughs> and all of it. I No, that's devastating to a Swifty. Like, mm-hmm. that's literally take me off this planet. I'm a Swifty. Like, I can't go Is to Chelsea the Eras tour. I don't I know. Don't, I don't think she's given out strong swifty indications i think it's more just the like general the general of the yeah like the the one of the most influential people on the planet has probably seen this side of you which is fine and you you know what fucking travis (laughs) tay tay was classy enough to not open the motherfucking heiress tour with y'all watching love is blind (laughs) with that girl who thinks she looks like megan fox Shut your fucking mouth, catching Kelsey. <laughs> like, I I do here. So here's the thing. I really don't like being a person who's like this fucking bitch. <laughs> Chelsea made me do that a lot. Yeah, because I really like. I really, really. She made it really hard to root for her. Mm-hmm. Like Katie, we've talked about this. Yeah. Like she got you mentioned. She gets in her own way all the time, and that's yeah. exactly what it is. You know, like, it it just became very clear that if I was the friend in this situation of Jimmy, I would have been like, cut and run, dude. Like, this is a lot of work. I'm tired. I'm tired of you texting me looking for support. I cannot do this for any longer. (laughs) Well, and I think for me, like, Jimmy and Chelsea are this very perfect example about how media and society create insecurities in women and how when presented with those insecurities with what within women men don't have the tools to like dispel them but she didn't come off as a person who had insecurity that's the thing and it seemed to only 
it seemed to always surface when she's been when she's drinking well yeah when do you get insecure i am so confident sober <laughs> oh. i'm not i listen i'm not an insecure drunk me what neither if, what if when I'm the so demons sorry, get me <laughs> I'm a very, I'm also a very secure woman, but I'm also a woman who, when I was insecure, did a good job gaslighting everyone into believing that I was secure. And I think as a former teacher and Chelsea being a stewardess and a flight attendant, you have, like, you get to put on the role of, like, the confident person in the room. Sure, there's, like, a performance to being a flight attendant. And I think what we saw in Love is Blind is, I mean, you have to have the will of a giant to, like, actually go through that. (laughs) Here's my, here's the thing that I'm hung up on. He was gone for an hour and a half and she lost her fucking shit. So, because I've been watching the interviews. Okay, tell me, because I haven't watched any of the interviews. She's claiming the bad edit and it was actually, he was gone every night. Um, He told her he was going to just he he goes i want to sleep at my own place tonight like i think we just need the break and she was like cool cool with me he facetimed her from bed in his jam jams and was like see i'm in bed and then he butt dialed her as his like girl posse came roaming into his room and they were talking about what bars they were hitting up (laughs) dang and again this okay so uh, so if it is a bad edit then netflix needs to be stopped (laughs) Because I can't be doing this whiplash shit because the problem is, is that people like me only see the show and we see that Chelsea's mad because he's gone for an hour and a half and that creates a different conversation and gives men the license to say, see, bitches be crazy without any context. There's no context. So then you have to go and watch all the fucking interviews to get context like Netflix. You need to be stopped. (laughs) Well, and that's why I think Netflix is actually the misogynist and the problem here. Yeah. I was certainly someone who was absolutely taken in by the edit of like... me too. (laughs) And I, and you know, since then, I feel like my position on both Jimmy and Chelsea have like, it's kind of, they've both moved inwards to be a more like neutral, like, oh, maybe they both kind of suck, but both are like kind of okay. And they take, maybe they bring out the worst in each other. And they probably have, bring up, yeah. There the are people that I used to be other. friends with. Yeah. Like, it was like, oh, I can't be in the same space as that person. I will be a bad guy. I will be all the things I hate. Because whatever it is, is, they bring that out in me. Yes. One of my internalized misogyny points is that insecurity, especially in women, is one of my biggest turnoffs. Yeah, I actually struggle with it, too. Yeah. Not that I'm insecure, but, like, friends who are insecure, I'm not the friend to text. Like, if you're having a panic attack or, like, a meltdown for a life crisis, I'm here. But if it's every, like, the the, um, amount of insecurity that we saw from Chelsea outside of the pods, I would have been like, we can't be friends anymore. But quietly. I wouldn't have told her because she's insecure. I would have just stopped responding. Yeah, I would have ghosted. You ghost insecure people. Um, (laughs) That's my, because I'm toxic and that's feminism. I'm allowed to be toxic and be every woman it's all in me um but my whole thing with toxic not toxic female insecure female friendships is that because i have done a lot of work and i am a secure woman i become the insecure woman's like oh not oprah that's a bad comparison i like yikes (laughs) i hype person yeah i no. i become their like leader they're like cult leader oh. i become the person like they want to check in on like are we doing this are we doing that did you like this did you like that and i really don't need a lot of like maintaining i don't need a lot of babysitting and i sure as hell don't need a lot of checking in on so then you annoy me <laughs> you're annoying this is okay so that's the thing i feel like my the thing about chelsea that that annoyed me the most that like my my particular chelsea trigger point because it does seem like we all had one it was the like not even the insecurity but the like need to have this man be like constantly reassured like just like she just like want like she want she wanted so much from from him and he was like "Eh." and what's like 
like he was, you know, he felt like he was giving her an appropriate amount of I mean, affection, reassurance, whatever. Yeah. So I'm saying that I'm Jimmy in insecure female friendships where I'm like, stop, I can't like I like write something on your mirror about how much you love yourself or something. Like, that is so funny because I'm like, I'm fine doing that for a for a friend. But like you're I'm sorry, you're trying to get that from a man? Right. right. Yeah. So then so then it comes back to this old school mentality of like your purpose, your role is to be that partner for that guy and in return they need to give you all these things. So you have to find value within yourself from a man. Like that right. that's what it yeah is to me. And and I didn't know that we were still raising women to believe that. Well, and, whether if it's consciously or subconsciously. Well, and part of my problem it's, is is I used to have a lot of the culture. Yeah, I know I, it is, but once you start decentering certain things, you forget they exist until you walk I, into that tunnel again. And you're like, oh shit, I forgot this is part of the world. I am a I am a woman who survived telling her mother I'm going to dump him. I don't like the way he speaks to me, and being bullied back with, "What you're so special? He brought you skittles to say he was sorry." <laughs> Like, right. I am sorry. I mean, that that yeah. was something that happened. Hi, mom. Sometimes her friends listen. And she'll be like, he did bring, like, she'll just call me and be like, I was right. I'll be like, yeah, cool. That's like would have been so much better. <laughs> like, that's like saying, you know, at least he doesn't hit you. No, but like, Stephanie and I know women, and it tends to be older women who, if they haven't hit you, they're not actually toxic or they're not actually being cruel because if they were cruel or toxic or someone you shouldn't be in a relationship with because of your safety, I get argued back and be like, that person's not an unsafe man. You really need to check your language. And I'm like, well, I think our definitions of toxic are different. Well, it's like the guy on Jeopardy, Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune or Family Feud who joked about murdering, made that joke about murdering his wife Family and feud. they did. <laughs> and Family then Feud. Did. Yeah, family feud. And you're just like, okay, but everyone was probably like, ha ha ha, he's so funny. Ooh, I'm not realizing he meant it. Because that's what we do, right? Like, we are encouraged yeah. to stay. Like you said, if they're not hitting you, it's a, it's a. And also, not wanting to spend time with someone is all the reason you need. Yes. <laughs> also, I will say this about the, the, as soon as the words Megan Fox left her mouth my that was entire, that was tough to come back from my entire body went uh like a Ugh! and it's not because i don't see the di the similarities between her and megan fox i am a woman who lives in america i am a woman who lives under patriarchy and misogyny i know that chelsea would not be classified as an obese or a fat or an oversized woman but men don't. I was like, oh, the fat phobia, Chelsea. You didn't even think about it. And good on her if she never thinks about fat phobia a day in her life. I was like, the world is going to tear you apart because you don't have a perfect body. <laughs> and now this is your legacy. Mm -hmm. And when you say, when you bring mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. that you look like Megan Fox. Uh-huh. The only thing the person you're talking to is now picturing is exactly Megan Fox. Exactly Megan Fox. And the only person who, as the internet has proven to us, who can who actually looks like Megan Fox is her from like 2020 or like tw like 2019 to 2022. Like, <laughs> you know, it's she doesn't even look in any picture of Megan Fox it's that's not who we're even thinking about when we think about Megan Fox I saw her and she did recently did I feel like call your daddy and she had blonde hair and I was like who is that you know like it's yeah so she really set herself up for a okay. while I think devastation or devastation I think what bothers me the most about insecure women is that a I know that I have work in my decentering of men and misogyny and patriarchy to realize that women are allowed insecurity right and it's mm -hmm. not at expense to my strength or my confidence but i was mad at chelsea for six whole weeks or three weeks how how long did they let us watch that show i don't know 
impossible to say it's impossible to say they're not consistent with the way they drop shit anyway so i was mad at her for hours because she had me me fruity for a man who looked like a thumb whose name was jimmy mm-hmm. <laughs> i think we all felt that way like stop yes. putting me on this man's side i don't yeah. like it i don't want to be a part of it i don't like it's- the way i'm feeling I saw it on Twitter. I saw it every discussion I was part of that involved Chelsea and Jimmy was Chelsea, the thing we are the most mad about is that we're on Jimmy's side. Yeah. And I did not want to be. I did not no. want to be either. I hated it. Every single time I was like, I feel sick that I'm on his team and I think that's why I hate you. Okay, everyone, that is it for part one of this mega conversation about Love is Blind season six. You can find part two of this conversation with Julia and Katie next week. We will be covering the couples, Laura, Jeremy, and then Sarah Ann, as well as AD and Clay, while wrapping up with our final thoughts, lessons, and manifestations. We'll see you next week, and thanks for being here.